Howdy, hello, how are you doing? My name is Victoria. If you're new here, if you're not new here, welcome back. Really happy to see you. I am a singer songwriter who wants to learn and open up conversations about music, the music industry. And today we are opening the conversation on the mysterious singer songwriter, Connie Converse, who was last seen in August of 1974. Before we get too deep into everything, I just want to say if you like music and music content, go ahead and hit the subscribe button for me. We're just chilling. But if not, you know, that's totally fine too. Without further ado, let's get into it. Connie was actually born Elizabeth Eaton Converse. She was born on August 3rd, 1924 in a city called Lasonia, New Hampshire. Lasonia is a smaller city and I'm sure it was even smaller back then, but it's still classified as a city and has been classified as a city since 1893. She was born into a pretty strict religious family. Her father, Ernest Converse, was actually a Baptist preacher. She had one younger brother named Phil and then an older brother named Paul, who I couldn't find much about, nor could I find much about her mother, Evelyn. Phil said that him and Connie were relatively isolated from their parents growing up, not that they weren't around, more so that their focus in the relationship was more so just discipline. Connie hated her first name, Elizabeth. She was not a fan. She didn't like Elizabeth and she didn't like any of the names nicknames that came along with Elizabeth. No Beth, no Liz, no nothing. However, she would not get the Connie nickname until much later in the story, but I will be referring to her as Connie. Connie was very creative and curious in her childhood. She enjoyed painting, writing short stories, and of course exploring with music. Her and Phil would invent games, reenact Shakespeare plays, and he actually said that he learned more culture at her knee than he ever did in a classroom, which I just think that is the sweetest thing. Like Phil, the the entire story you're going to see that Phil really really just loved his sister. However, Connie always had a sad air about her. Her brother told a story about when they were children, one of Connie's close friends had committed suicide. The community was talking about it and she kept hearing everybody speak on it and she really really didn't like that. She thought that that was a very private matter. She felt that it shouldn't be discussed, that that was very very personal, and her brother actually quoted her to say, "If anything should be left up to a person, it should be whether or not to live, which that sounds wild to come out of a child's mouth. Connie was very, very intelligent. All throughout school, she received high marks and good grades and even graduated valedictorian from her high school. At her graduation ceremony from Concord High School, she was also given various, various academic awards. And instead of being proud of her, her parents were embarrassed. They felt as though the award should have been spread out more fairly among the students. That just sounds ridiculous to me. It's not her fault she's smarter than all the other kids. Nonetheless, she graduated and then she went to college. She had received a scholarship to go to Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, which was also the college that her mother and her grandmother had attended before her. At college, she was introduced to her first taste of life outside of her strict religious upbringing. And this is actually when she got the nickname of Connie. And she loved it, so she kept going by it. During this time, she also began drinking and smoking, which plenty of people do at college. But for her parents, this was absolutely unacceptable. It was even more unacceptable when she dropped out her second year to pursue a career as a singer-songwriter. Connie's parents refused to support her any further and were absolutely gutted by her decision to leave college. Her father specifically was so upset that he passed away without ever even hearing Connie's music, which is just heartbreaking. But despite the protest from her parents, Connie continued forward on her path and thank God that she did. Connie moved from Massachusetts to New York City and got a job at the Academy Photo Offset Printing House. In her free time, Connie was writing and performing her music, hauntingly comforting tunes accompanied by herself on the guitar. Her music was nothing like anyone had heard before, and she had no idea that one day she would be looked back on as one of the first prolific singer-songwriters ever. Her brother Phil said that Connie wrote because she had to as a way of coping with life. That's a pretty common theme for artists in the music industry to use their music as a coping mechanism or as a comforting way to channel their emotions and their experiences. And Connie was one of the first artists to do that like she did. 
She had over 40 songs within her body of work consisting of original lyricism, poems put with music, feminist anthems, and her own experiences spun into metaphorical melodies. Her music left a lasting impression, and in 1954, the right person finally heard Connie. Jean Deitch came across Connie at a performance and was struck by her sophisticated writing and evocative instrumentation. Jean was actually an animator and worked extensively on Tom and Jerry, which is a wild little random fact in this case. He said there were many better singers, but few were as intelligent, literate, or as beautiful as Connie. That same year, Gene brought Connie to his home studio and they recorded several songs together. After the songs were recorded, she had her first and only television appearance on the CBS morning show with Walter Cronkite. She carried on for a while, but in 1961, Bob Dylan arrived in Greenwich Village and swept up the audiences that Connie had been trying to capture for 10 years at that point. To put it simply, the people were not ready for the music that Connie was making and she just didn't get the traction she needed at that time. She hadn't gotten any contracts or deals and was always met with rejection letters telling her that she wasn't sellable. Later that year, Connie left New York City and her dreams of being a musician behind. She moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan to be closer with family and got a job as a secretary at the University of Michigan where her brother worked as a professor. She then moved to working as a writer for the Journal of Conflict Resolution. Slowly, she stopped writing or recording any music at all. She slipped heavier into her smoking and drinking and was just generally a sad person. She wasn't satisfied despite liking her job at the journal, it just wasn't what she had always wanted. Her brother said that she was depressed in ways that nobody understood. All of this got worse in 1972 when the Journal of Conflict Resolution, at which she had been working for the last 10 years, was auctioned off to Yale University without Connie's knowledge. So basically she got the rug swept out from under her. Her colleagues and friends were so concerned about Connie's well-being that they actually all raised money to send her on a trip to London for six to eight months to hopefully raise her spirits a little bit. And she did go, but unfortunately, on her arrival back home, nothing had changed. The trip did not magically cure her dissatisfaction for life. Nonetheless, her mother decided to give the trip idea one more try and took Connie to Alaska. Connie went, did as she was asked, and still, when they got back, she still felt bad. And when they got home from Alaska, her mother immediately started planning another trip and it just pushed Connie further and further into the hole. She did not want anything to do with that. On top of that, it was around this time as well that Connie was told that she would need a hysterectomy. This was devastating news for Connie as someone who really enjoyed children and had saw that for herself and her future. And in general, that's a really, really difficult thing to experience whether you want kids or not. Like it's just a huge medical procedure. And especially during that time, it was a whole different ball game. So that just made it worse for her. After the hysterectomy, Connie was at an all-time low. In 1974, Connie's brother Phil invited her away for the summer, but Connie declined. She spent June and July packing up her belongings into her brother's attic for storage or into her Volkswagen Beetle. Among the things stored was a filing cabinet filled to the brim with every label rejection Connie had ever received, labeled and organized and left for the dust. In August of 1974, right after Connie's 50th birthday, she wrote letters to all of her loved ones. In these letters, she detailed her deterioration mentally and her loss of passion for life and talked about how she wanted to start over to pursue a new life. She said that all efforts by friends and family thus far in Ann Arbor was very much appreciated but had failed to make her feel better. A full copy of one of the letters will be linked in the description below, but I am going to read an excerpt from one of the letters that I found found to be the best representation of her tone. Let me go. Let me be if I can. Let me not be if I can't. To survive it all, I expect I must drift back down through the other half to the 20th 20th, which I already know pretty well, to the 100th 100th, which I only read and heard about. I might survive there quite a few years, who knows, but you understand I have to do it by myself, with no benign umbrella. Human society fascinates me and awes me and fills me with grief and joy. I just can't find my place to plug into it. So let me go, please. And please accept my thanks to those happy times that each of you has given me over the years. And please know that I would have preferred to give you more than I ever did or could. I am in everyone's debt. By the time those words would reach their recipients, Connie was already gone. She packed up her Volkswagen and disappeared. 
Neither she nor her car has been seen since. Connie, before she left, had actually asked her brother Phil to continue paying her health insurance to a certain point. Beyond that, allegedly a friend of Connie's had received a phone call from her sometime between 1975 and 1976, which would be at least a year after Connie's disappearance. In this phone call, Connie allegedly apologized to this friend for setting her up with a man who she had recently divorced. And this was the very last time that anyone even claimed to hear from Connie. They hired a private investigator at one point. There are literally tons of theories about this and I'll link to a couple videos in my description that I looked at to look at the theories, but I'm more so focusing on her story. So for the theories, check the links in the description. Her letters could be interpreted as many different types of goodbyes, if you know what I mean. It wasn't until 2004 that Connie's legacy would be reignited again. And coincidentally enough, it was by the same man who gave her her start in the beginning, Gene Deitch. In January of 2004, now 80 years old, Gene appeared on a radio show hosted by music historian David Garland, where he brought along a scratchy copy of Connie's single, One by One, that he had recorded all the way back in the 50s. Two of Garland's listeners, Dan Zula and David Herman, were so enthralled by this music that they tracked down the rest of Connie's discography as much as they could find. Some of it was in Gene's personal collection in Prague, which is where he was from, and other parts of it were in an Ann Arbor library where they had found piano tracks and special songs that Connie had sent to her brother Phil. The two new Connie fans created a music label called Squirrel Things Recordings, the name being a lyric from one of Connie's most famous songs, Talking Like You, Two Tall Mountains. After decades of collecting dust and being this close to disappearing just as the artist had, Connie's music was finally released and she was finally being appreciated and heard and valued as an artist. How Sad, How Lovely was first released in 2009 as 17 songs, then re-released in 2015 with 18 songs. Since then, we have also gotten an album of Connie's piano songs and a new single just this year. I personally find it so interesting how the title of this album, How Sad, How Lovely, eerily summarizes her own life story before she knew how it was going to go, but she did write it. How sad it was that it happened the way that it did, but how lovely that even in her absence, her music has solidified her spot as one of the most incredible, mysterious, and important songwriters in all of music history. And that is the sad, lovely, mysterious story of one of my favorite artists of all time, Connie Converse. My question for you is, what do you think happened to Connie? If she was still alive today, which is a possibility because no one ever saw her again, we honestly don't know. If she was still alive today, she would be 97 years old. But the reality is we may really never know what happened to Connie. But I am so grateful that we have her music. Thank you so much for hanging out and listening to me talk about one of my favorite artists today. If you liked it and you want to stick around for more music content in the future, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, the like button, and turn on post notifications so you are the first at the function for next week's video. I upload every single week. I'm also active on Instagram, TikTok especially. I do a lot of polls for YouTube content on those, so definitely check those out if you want to. For the month of October, I really do want to format my content in a very spooky season way, so if there's there's any other music mysteries you'd like me to dive into definitely let me know and again thank you all so much for hanging out with me I genuinely hope you have a wonderful day morning night evening whatever time you're watching this I appreciate you being here I appreciate you wanting to listen to music with me and just hear me talk that's like really wild so I appreciate you and I will see y'all next week mm -hmm.